Hello, my name is Dr. Roger Henderson, and I have a GP in Southwest Scotland, and I also co-host the GP Notebook Study Groups. Welcome to the GP Notebook Podcast, where we discuss bite-sized topics aimed at all those of us working in primary care. Now, you can find us on all major podcast platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. So do please follow us to receive notifications about new episodes, and if you like what you hear please consider leaving a review to help other listeners find us. You can also follow us on Twitter at GP Notebook for more information about new podcast episodes and study groups, and you can find me there too, at Roger the Doctor. Finally, you can visit gpnotebook.com for podcast episode show notes and to find out more about upcoming study group meetings. Now, in this episode, I'm going to be discussing Bowen's disease, essentially a form of intraepidermal squamous cell carcinoma of the skin. Now, it's called Bowen's disease because it was first described by the dermatologist John Bowen in 1912. It arises in the outer layers of the epidermis, and it is normally a relatively harmless, even benign condition, but there is a risk of progression to invasive squamous cell carcinomas. Now, although that risk is low, between 2 to 3%, typically, it is something we should be aware of because it is not a completely harmless condition if left. Now, the incidence is highest, appears to, appears to be highest in white people living in areas of high sunlight exposure, which shouldn't come as any uh, kind of shock, I suppose, when we look at the risk factors. But what is sometimes surprising is it is more common in women than in men. And I think that is slightly surprising to some of us because men are bolder than women, and so you'd think their risk of sun exposure may be slightly higher. Generally, it occurs in older people, by which I mean between the ages of 60 and 75. It is actually uncommon in young people. Now, let's not forget uh, that squamous cell carcinomas, um, precursor lesions, are actinic and solar keratoses. So someone with actinic and solar keratoses is slightly at increased risk of Bowen's disease. So sun damage is a definite risk factor, especially if that person has fair skin. Obviously, sunbeds are now an increasing risk, and let's not forget about ultraviolet light. Ultraviolet A ages the skin, ultraviolet light B burns the skin. Radiotherapy, as a treatment, can also put someone at increased risk of Bowen's disease. Now, although we hardly ever see this these days, arsenic, uh, especially inorganic arsenic, um, is a carcinogen, and we used to use it in Fowler's solution to treat psoriasis and also in gay solution to treat asthma. Now obviously those are long gone but in some countries uh, especially with pesticides as well you can still get arsenic exposure. Viral infections however are more significant because there is a definite association with HPV especially if you've got perianal and genital lesions and lesions on the hand and the feet. If you have an immunosuppressed patient, they appear to be more at risk as well. And very rarely it can appear in pre-existing other skin lesions. And I'm thinking of things like seborrheic warts here and chronic skin injuries. Now, we all probably remember what Bowen's disease looks like. But the key point here is it's very, very slow growing. It is a reddened erythematous type hyperkeratotic small patch of skin and two big points here with an irregular border that is sharply demarcated and I think those are the two really important things to look for. It can scale and that scale can fall off, it can then crust and then rescale over again and it can reach up to a few centimeters in size but for most people they present with one to two centimeters when they realize that lesion isn't going away. Now, the size of the lesion, therefore, is directly related to how long it's been present. Usually cause no symptoms at all. Very rarely they can bleed, but I don't see that very often. 
in my experience, the most common symptom is itch. But an important point here is that that itch is intermittent. It is not constant. One of the things to remember if you see someone with a patch of Bowen's is not to forget about the rest of their body. If you see someone with Bowen's, the next thing you should do is examine them from top to toe for other lesions, not just Bowen's, but for other lesions because they are at increased risk of other skin malignancies. And up to about 20% of people, if you examine someone, you will find other patches of Bowen's on their body. Now, sun-exposed areas obviously are where they're found most commonly. But you can also find them, for example, in the palmar, genital or perianal re uh, re uh, regions. You may have heard in your um, medical student days something called erythroplasia of Querat, or EQ. Now, this is essentially as Bowen's on the mucosal surface of the glands penis. Personally, I've never seen that, but it is an area that can be affected by Bowen's. Now, one of the reasons why Bowen's can sometimes be delayed in terms of a diagnosis is because there is quite a significant differential diagnosis list that you can put towards it. Discoid eczema is perhaps the one that most people think uh, is a likely diagnosis when in fact the diagnosis is Bowen's. Psoriasis can look like it, but you would expect multiple other plaques of psoriasis rather than just a single isolated plaque. An actinic or solar keratosis can look very similar, but again there are often more than one, and lichen planus is something we shouldn't forget about as well. There's usually relatively little pigment in a Bowen's, um, so malignant melanoma should be spotted uh, rather than being missed or mistaken as a Bowen's, and a superficial basal cell carcinoma also can have similar symptoms. And I suppose the key point here is if you're not certain about the diagnosis, then take a photograph, send that to your local dermatologist, get their advice sooner rather than later. Now, if you're used to using a dermatoscope, then this is the ideal way to diagnose a Bowen's. Usually uh, diagnosed clinically. If it's a classic example, you can diagnose it without that. But if there's any doubt, then a punch biopsy is obviously the way to diagnose one histologically. When we look at treatment for Bowen's, it's quite interesting. There is no specific definitive treatment or indeed treatment pathway that every clinician follows. And so all therapeutic options have a degree of failure rates with them. And so factors influencing the choice of treatment we can use are things like the size of the Bowens, the location, how many there are, and the age of the patient. And we should be discussing the possible treatment options with each patient so they fully understand the treatments we've got available and actually give them a choice in the type of treatments that they would like and be able to have. In no particular order, I think that I would normally look at destructive therapies first, then go on to topical therapies, and then go on to surgical options. So by destructive treatment, I'm thinking of liquid nitrogen, simply to freeze the lesion. Um, the efficacy of this does appear to be operator dependent, uh, but it is simple, it's quick, it's effective, especially if the lesion is less than two centimeters in diameter, and it's often first line therapy. You often don't need more than one or two uh, treatments usually, and the recurrence rate is extremely low. You would expect complete re uh, resolution of Bowen's in up to about 90% of cases when, when uh, liquid nitrogen freezing is used appropriately. For topical treatments, I'd go straight to topical 5-fluorouracil, 5-FU cream. It may be as effective as uh, other treatments. It's certainly a practical choice for larger lesions compared to cryotherapy, although it may be slightly more effective when preceded by cryotherapy. Imiquimod 5%, um, it's an immune response modifying agent. Again, there's evidence that it's effective for the treatment of Bowen's, although it's not currently licensed in the UK. Um, and it does cause significant scaling and inflammation, as can 5-FU cream. So if you're going to use a topical treatment on someone with Bowen's, do always advise them that they may get an increased area 
of reddening and inflammation and even some slight discomfort which is expected before the lesion then starts to settle away again. It's important to tell them that otherwise they may just stop the treatment. If we're looking at surgery, I'm talking about um, curatage with cautery and this can work extremely well and what happens here you simply scrape off any abnormal skin under a local anaesthetic and if there's any additional tissue there you just destroy that with electrocautery. It's very simple, it's safe, it's cost effective and certainly compared to cryo there does seem to be faster healing, um, reduced um, discomfort and recurrence rates may be better with it. But I think there's relatively little between the two in my experience. Might not be suitable for all parts of the body though because a five millimeter resection margin is recommended. If you've gone through those destructive topical and surgical options, well, photodynamic therapy is on the cards. Um, it's certainly a highly studied treatment for Bowens. If you've got very large lesions, it can be extremely helpful because it's much better tolerated than cryo and recurrence rates are no worse than the other options. And so what you do is you remove the scaly crusted area and then you put on a photosensitizing cream that's covered and left for a little while and then you expose it to a light source which then burns away the sensitized area. Now that can be uncomfortable and again you have to let the patient know that. Fortunately for Bowen's the prognosis is excellent. Actually you be unlucky to have long-term problems with Bowen's if it's not treated but obviously that's not the best option and we should always be treating because if you leave a Bowen's untreated two to three percent will progress to invasive squamous cell carcinoma and that's what we want to avoid at all costs. However metastases are rare and there's certainly no association between Bowen's and any internal malignancies. The only exception to the 3% rule, I suppose, is that if you've got Bowen's of the penis, the risk of progression um, is higher, up to sort of 8 to 10% uh, in some studies. So always definitely look at that one and make sure that you haven't missed that on a patient. So once you've treated someone with Bowen's, you then have to advise lifelong prevention uh, advice. So always use sun protective behavior. So always wear sun protective clothing outdoors. Avoid the midday, midday sun, especially between 11 and three. Always use broad spectrum sunscreen and sunblocks. Avoid sunbeds because we are seeing a slight increase in Bowen's in younger people who have used sunbeds extensively. And just, as I say, remind them that for life, they have to be very careful when they go out in the sun. However, aside from all that, prognosis is excellent and we should be able to readily treat Bowen's in our surgeries. So I do hope you found that very brief overview of Bowen's helpful, but do have a look at the show notes that accompany this episode at gpnotebook.com and we'd be very grateful if you consider following the podcast and leaving us a review on your favourite podcast platform. Do feel free to get in touch via social media at GP Notebook or email us support at gpnotebook.com if you have any questions, comments or ideas for future podcasts. You should also visit us at gpnotebook.com to register for our virtual GP Notebook study groups and download free shortcuts to help improve the lives of our patients in primary care. But as always, until the next time, goodbye.